Just a friendly reminder that the opinions expressed on this show are not worth a Canadian penny, so disregard anything you hear that might get anyone in trouble. And despite some of the great ideas you may hear, don't try them at home. Go to friend's house instead. And now we're going to move on to the rest of the show. <laughs> oh, is he frozen? Is he frozen? Oh, I'm still here. No, he's not. Oh, yeah, oh. there you are. Okay. Yeah. No, we're, we're going to move on with the rest of the show now. Okay. So, you like, yeah, thanks do, for coming uh, on. S- sign off. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Bye, guys. Me. Okay, later. Welcome to Slam Fire Radio, episode 5. 20 recording live on Wednesday, August 16th. I'm one of your hosts, Mo. I'm another one, Adriel. And I'm another one, Kyle. Hello, gentlemen. Hello. Hello. Evening. Evening. Uh, who wants to get us started? Adriel, why don't you tell us what you did in Guns this week? Yeah, hey, mine's short, so why not? Okay. Uh, I did a maple seed. Ah. Uh-huh. Like, uh, like most weekends in the summer that uh, I'll be doing, but, uh, this one was in uh, Blind Man Valley, and uh, it was uh, that's kind of near Red Deer, so kind of like Central Alberta. Um, nice little range, perfect. Actually, really well suited for maple seed, like the size and the scope and everything was was just excellent. So, uh, yeah, good event. Two people patched and a couple juniors and whatever. Great time. Camped out there. Did the did the van camp thing overnight beforehand, which makes it a lot nicer for the morning because. I wake up and the line's set up and all my gears out of the van and it's underneath the shelter. It's ready to rock and roll. And it's all good. It's all really good. Uh, I was to have another one at Edson uh, this weekend coming up, but we didn't have enough uh, attendees registered. So we canceled that one. And uh, so now I'm going to go camping. I'm going to go camping this weekend. I don't know where yet. Yeah. Maybe in the mountains, maybe somewhere close. Uh, not really sure. Um, and I need to uh, mail a couple things. I still need to mail Richard his lower receiver. It's sitting on the counter next to me here. And I need to mail that back too. The, that one right there. Uh, that brand two. So you're, not gonna, box. you're not going to keep it? Uh, that's not an option, but uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very nice. But uh, no, that's not an option. So uh, all so right, all right, we get mailed off. But uh, uh, the high point, well, no, I probably won't actually go back up there. No, the high point won't go back up there. No. But uh, well, you gotta show it be, off. That'll be my, my <laughs> next project. Project that I'm working on is is uh, dremeling the hell out of that thing to uh, to get those mags to fit. But wow. Oh, your mic dropped out. Anything there. else that's uh, that's gun related? Oh. Did it? Am yeah, I back now? We lost you. Ah, uh, my internet did just did something funky. So uh, who knows what's going on? Anyways, I'll pass it on to someone else who has better internet. Kyle. Hey. Okay. Uh, so I stepped up my uh, parts cleaning game. I went out and bought a Sonic cleaner. Nice. So, and How big? I don't know why. Hmm. How big of a sonic cleaner did you get? Uh, two and a half liter. Okay. Is it that little plastic one with the buttons on the top, or is it like one of the stainless steel like? Oh no, it's just the units. plastic one, not the big uh, industrial yeah. ones. Yeah, I got that one. I got the little yeah. plastic one. Yeah, just uh, bought it from Harbor Freight and tried it out. And I don't know why it's taken me so long to get one because I was pretty impressed by it. <laughs> uh, Do you, you want to? Did you um, use a secondary container to put uh, solvent in? No. So I'm gonna I'm gonna blow your freaking mind with how to how to like get this thing to clean like the nastiest shit ever. But you take like a jar or something that's impermeable. You stick whatever you want to clean in there with nasty solvent, gasoline, whatever you want to put in there. 
Um, and then you put that into the ultrasonic that just has water in it, right? So your ultrasonic doesn't have anything nasty in it. Does It's going to be easy to clean. There's this jar of like grossness that's in the middle. You hit it. The ultrasonic goes right <laughs> through the jar or whatever. And it nukes whatever's in the middle there with solvent and with the ultrasonic. So it just basically obliterates whatever kind of crap you got on there. And then hmm. you also don't have flash rust afterwards because the solvent won't cause flash rust, which I find the water does because it like the ultrasonic does a such a good uh, job of cleaning off like whatever metal that as soon as you take it out, you start getting that flash rust on there. Oh, so you're you're not diluting your your solution at all. No, I'm, um, well, I, I, I like I, I like diesel. I picked up the uh, <laughs> Lyman Turbo Sonic Cleaner stuff and it's concentrated mm-hmm. so it wanted me to do it like 20 to 1 or whatever mm-hmm. so i was gonna actually ask how often do people change out their their solution <laughs> uh i think it depends how like what you've put it through it these toker was when i first got them they're like covered in cosmoline and they had cosmoline like inside the action yeah. and inside like all the little like nooks and crannies i couldn't be bothered cleaning that crap off so <laughs> in you go into the diesel in the jar and then let the ultrasonic like attack it. And it does it. It did a hell of a job getting all that cosmoline out without having to scrub it and get like dental picks out to get all that crap out of there. Yeah. I put my gas block through it and I can adjust it now. <laughs> <laughs> I got the threads, eh? Yeah. And I uh, actually put my bolt and bolt carrier through it. And I don't think it's been that clean ever. And I've, I've gone to town on, bolt carrier before and i don't yeah i don't know if it's ever been that clean so yeah definitely happy with that and uh sorry tony i got it at uh, princess auto is that better (laughs) yeah princess auto is our equivalent here yeah Yeah. it's not quite as magical but it's pretty magical (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's after walking in they're pretty darn close in fact actually i'd say princess auto actually has more than harbor freight so uh other than that so i did some work to my rifle got the ha- new handguard put on there and uh, it was really nice they actually sent some uh little shims for the uh barrel nut so you can get that timed just right and uh so yeah that was nice and liking the the color combination it feels good in the hand and yeah uh one thing though uh, stainless steel crush washers. I hope you don't have to take your comp off and have to pull your gas block or anything because once they once you tighten them on, it it I was actually scared I was threatening the threads on my barrel because it crushed down and it did not bounce back. Huh. Yeah. Cause I yeah, I had some nice shiny stainless uh crush washers and I thought, oh, this is the greatest thing ever. And yeah, no. I will never use one again. <laughs> Didn't even know it was an option. Yeah, I found back, what was it, 2018, I found them down here, and they've just been sitting in my kit, just a bunch of parts sitting there. So when I put it together, I'm like, oh, I'll actually put a, I'll treat this rifle nice and put a new crush washer on. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, new handguard that has a lot more space, so we'll get it out to the range and check it out. We're on YouTube tonight, otherwise I would grab my rifle. But, uh, yeah, I ended up replacing the the uh, gas tube as well. Just freshen it up right. I had, a, I had a brand new one sitting here, so just replaced it. Punched it out of the gas block and replaced it because it was all older parts that I put on. Like, well, older parts, used parts that I put on there before when I built it. So just trying to get it fresh, and then I can go deal and tune it afterwards i got a bit of time before my my next big match so i have some time to play around with that uh and then yeah this weekend i have a uspsa match so just local one here in town local one okay Yeah. yeah so so yeah that is it for me all right Uh, I had another non-shooting week, so uh, no matches again. I'm gonna be shoot. I'm gonna do one not this weekend, uh, the weekend after, and then I'll have to start uh, 
getting ready for it to do a little bit of practice and stuff because I haven't done at anything at all. Um, I was just checking out on YouTube. I was checking out a lot of um, videos from the Ipsa Canada National Handgun Championship, which is part of our main topic tonight. So I was just like checking out the stages because that took place in uh, Selkirk, uh, the Selkirk Range in Manitoba. I guess not too far from Winnipeg. And mm-hmm. uh, really, that's it. But I'm looking forward to getting back to shooting. I, I miss it as much as I get frustrated that I don't do better. I still miss just being out there. So that's that. Uh, we will get into upcoming events. Uh, there's, I think there were more Maple Seed uh, dates posted. I'm pretty sure I saw an email come through. Yeah, sent out an email. We had, uh, what was in there? Chilliwack opened up in BC. And then there we had a, a couple in Alberta. The uh, Kananaskis one opened up. It's rapidly filling up. It's probably full by now, but uh, that one that one opened up. And then we've got Fort McMurray. Uh, Chaz has a couple spots in September. Um, I think that covers all of Alberta. There was one more in there. Maybe New Brunswick or Nova Scotia or something like that. Okay. And you can, they can mm-hmm. check it out at uh, mapleseedrifleman.com. Yep. Okay. Uh, ELGC is hosting the fourth annual Lane Leonard Memorial Outlaw Match. Main event Sunday, August 27th. Start time, 9.30 a.m. And you can find that on practice score. Where's uh, ELGC? Is that like Ontario? That is an ex- yeah. co- excellent question. I it's don't. Ontario. Sundridge, Ontario. We get so used to using like the, the short versions of our club names like yeah. Chaz or SBFGA. And it's like, yeah, ELGC is hosting. It's like, mm, where's that? <laughs> it's like around the corner from you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're in Ontario practically. Just and next door, um, right? Yeah. Uh, so I guess the PCFGA range. Wow. Is uh, hosting a three-gun match on August uh, 19th. So that's going to be this weekend. Uh, I guess uh, starts uh, set up at um, 6 p.m. Friday. Uh, so, And that's not on practice score. I learned last week, right? Yeah, no, that's maybe. correct. Yeah, That's correct. Okay. And uh, the ORA has upcoming events that you can check out on practice score. Uh, in the news, I guess there's no major stories, good or bad, uh, but the TACCOM event is coming up in beginning of September. I guess tickets have been on mm-hmm. sale for a while. And uh, we'll get into new gun stuff brought to you by Bullseye North. Need a new boomstick? Bullseye North is Canada's shooting superstore and a proud supporter of the CCFR. With a wide selection of guns and top 10 trending gear for any shooter. Free shipping over $200. Some exclusions apply, like ammo. Subscribe to their weekly newsletter to get first access to the hottest deals. Cool. Uh, Let me get my screen ready here. Present. Share screen. Uh, This one. Am I going bottom up? Probably. Uh, <laughs> pop over to Bullseye. So Bullseye right now, they have uh, 11 different kinds of BCL ripe models available uh, with free shipping. Uh, they have the SRV2 Siberian. They got t- the TRX Bronco. That's that uh, crazy bolt action one they've got in 308. Okay. And they've got the MRX Bison, which is in 556. And they've got a bunch of other kinds. So okay. I'm going to take a look at one of those. They got that. Looking for like a kind of like a bang around like a quad gun, something that you can like yeah. just kind of take uh, you know grouse hunting and you know just like hit it off trees and that kind of thing. <laughs> uh, Calgary Shooting Center, they've got some uh, Krieghoff. Krieghoff. I haven't heard of this name before. It's probably Krieghoff. Like oh Turkish. yeah, they're it's probably Turkish. Yeah, they're right? definitely they're they're a nice uh, quad gun. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> nice quad gun. Yeah, this is pretty much on the same quality as like a Charles for, Valley for that price. Like that you're getting a mid sized sedan. To come with it, or uh, no, you you know as well as we do that uh, that mid sized sedans are much more expensive than that yeah, right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, this this gets you a, a used one that's miled out that's got like 200,000 kilometers on it. Ah, uh, got it, yeah. got it. Uh, yeah, Calgary Shooting Center has some Kriegoff shotguns if you're uh, into uh, fine things and uh, very fine, 
what was payment plans. On, yeah, what financing? was the price on that bottom one? I just. Oh, this is a single 13. shot rifle, oh, though. Oh, yeah, thirteen okay. grand. It's a single shot. That's like your your beginner, oh, your, yeah. your bargain. You know, yeah. bargain. value price. Oh, one. It's like a, yeah. a cooey, basically. Oh, step <laughs> mm rem mag in six and a half pounds. This thing's gonna obliterate your shoulder. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. Uh. yeah, it's gonna have some recoil. Yeah, it's gonna have some recoil. Uh, speaking of fine things, uh, they also have Desert Tech. So, uh, ah. if you're looking at uh, the Desert Tech SRS M2, uh, they have the standard covert. Covert's got a shorter barrel on it. It's like a bullpup rifle. They're right around fifty eight hundred bucks. Uh, this is just the chassis. This is just the oh. chassis. No, is that no. just a... SRS rifles and covert. It says standard. There's, chassis. I don't Maybe see it's a yeah, rifle. I don't Where's see an barrel? action in there. There's no action in there. there. No action in there. This is just the this is just the chassis. So you're gonna have to keep like so get a another bolt bush out. gun, another just quad, yeah. dent special, yeah. <laughs> half MOA guarantee. All rifles and conversion kits are guaranteed to shoot half MOA or better. Multi caliber, I guess so, since it's just the stock. I think it's just the stock. Uh, chassis, 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 chassis. I don't see like a rifle there. A complete rifle, no. Mm, mm, okay. Maybe they have one in the next one here. Oh, there oh, we there's... go. There's a conversion kit. So twenty five hundred. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you're up to eight K. Mm. Well, you put, you need like the rest of it too. Yeah, okay. like that's that. Yeah, you still need a receiver. Plus, 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 like. plus. <laughs> yeah. Anywho. Those are fancy, yep. and not something we typically cover. Here's something maybe a little bit more uh, approachable. Uh, SFRC has uh, got some bushnels on sale right now. There's a bunch of bushnels that are uh, that have a 25% mail-in rebate. So uh, any bushnel rifle scope or laser rangefinder from August 15th to September 15th. So that's on now. Uh, oh, let's set. buy now. Get 25% off the purchase price of any bushnel trail camera as well. So. Looks like they're moving some product ahead of uh, hunting season. If you're looking for something with a, a decent sale. I run guns has the, I, I seem to be picking a lot of very expensive uh, firearms this week, but uh, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. unlike you, Adriel, <laughs> well, this isn't bad. Two grand U S U S 2,800 Canadian. Yeah. Uh, I run guns has got the CZ Bren two MS's in 760 by 39 with nine inch barrels. Whoa. That, that shit's gonna bark. Why wouldn't you uh, just get yeah? Get what? Something the non-restricted version for the same price. Besides, they yeah, don't it's... have them. Where are you? Where are yeah. you gonna find one of those? Where are you gonna find? Yeah. Where is this mystical non-restricted CZ brand two? And seven sixty two by thirty nine. They don't even have them. There's yeah. there's none up here. I guess yeah. Uh, seven sixty two by thirty nine. Yeah. Yeah. They're all being converted, so yeah. you can't find uh you can't find these things unless they're a conversion, and those have a waiting list on them. Did, did you guys and have an order boring. from uh, I, uh, I Run Guns? Oh, yeah. They're actually they, in Sherwood uh, Park. They're, like, really close to where I live. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Range View has primers. Ooh. Would you look at that? Small pistol, small rifle, small rifle magnum, small pistol magnum, no large rifle, federal gold medal, 6.5 Creedmoor, once fired. Small rifle primer brass. I didn't know you could f- buy once fired primers. Is this just brass? What is this? What am I looking at? Brass. I'm looking at just, 10, just, your, six, just five, the brass. More. That's just, just the brass. brass. Yeah, yeah. I'm not paying 10 bucks for brass. Anyway, for 10 rounds of brass. But yeah, I mean, like on sale, I should be able to get that stuff for like thirty-five bucks for a box of like twenty, right? So why would I? Why would I pay ten bucks just for the brass? Anywho, maybe I shouldn't be just okay. randomly stating that kind of thing. All right, that was the uh, pricier edition of uh, new gun stuff. <laughs> and for tonight's main topic, we have Remy Dusay to. T- on to talk to us about the Ipsa Canada National Handgun Championship that he just attended, as well as his shooting experience and a bunch of other stuff. Welcome, Remy. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And uh, when I say attended, you didn't just attend 
the championship, you ended up being the number one overall winner. So big congratulations on that. Thank you very much. Was was that your uh, first win for a Nationals? It uh, it was not. So this, uh, I've, I mean, I've been at this game for long enough, I suppose. I took my black badge in 2009, so that gives you an idea. 2009, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, this was, I believe, my, quick math, uh, eighth Nationals, I think. Okay. And I've actually won, this was my fourth win. Nice. Yes. And this is my, this is actually my, um, this is actually very special for me, something I've been trying to attain for a long time it is my uh, it is now a national title win in three different divisions. Ah, so production right. standard and open. Yeah. So and this was your first as an open shooter. Correct. Okay. And then previously you were, you were shooting standard before that. That's right. Oh, very nice. That's, that's definitely something. <laughs> Would you attribute yeah. your wins to like match prep and, and dedicated practice or just having like smooth, like, aerodynamic hairstyles like like the rest of us here that's right yeah no i, I just i just close my eyes and pull the trigger i get nervous right so um no definitely uh definitely a, a ton of practice a ton of work i mean i'm sure we can i can talk to you about a length about it if you really want so yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna i was gonna ask about that but before we get into that and and the natural actual nationals um you said you got your black badge in 2009 um right. how did you actually get into shooting did you grow up with guns is this something you got into a little bit later in life um so i've always essentially been around guns my whole life my uh my father was a hunter an avid hunter really that was his passion and not only that he was an rcmp officer so you know uh, guns of all kinds i you know, shotguns, rifles, everything, even, even, you know, he'd let me see his service pistol sometimes. Right. And I think as early as maybe eight or nine or 10 years old, right. He's, I have a memory of him handing me like a small little 22 cooey. And, uh, it's like, Oh, we're going to hunt rabbits today or son. I'm like, cool. You know, let's go shoot stuff. And, uh, so yeah, no, I've always been, I've hunted with him from a very young age and, uh, I always kind of did enjoy or, or like the idea of, of, uh, shooting pistols too. So, um, but it wasn't until I was maybe, you know, I mean, shooting is, is definitely something that takes you know time and money. So it wasn't until I, uh, I was, I was 25, I think when I started really shooting pistols, I finally had a career and I'd finished education and all that. And so I was able to finally buy my own pistol. I joined a range and, you know, just like everyone else started just general handgun, start shooting on the line. And uh, within, I think, less than a year of starting to do that, I had a, a coworker who he was doing uh, Ipsic, and he and he showed me a video of him shooting this sport, and I was like, as soon as I saw the video, I was like, oh my god, why aren't I doing this? It looks amazing, <laughs> right? So then it wasn't long after that that uh, Black Badge, and then the rest is history, I guess. Yeah, and then it became a big part of your life, obviously. Yeah, I, I mean, I have never encountered another activity or sport that I've ever done that I was, I guess, this addicted to, I suppose, or enthralled with, right? It's just, it just keeps you coming back, right? There's, it's, um, it never ends. There's always a challenge because you're just battling against yourself, right? Like every, every stage, every match, like, um, it's just, you can always do better. There's always something you can chase. It's kind of neat that way. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, outside of uh, Ipsic, are, are you doing any other competitive shooting of any kind or just casual? Um, I mean, for a little while, years ago, I think I did some, I dabbled in some IDPA, but I mean, um, I would say generally speaking, I uh, I always kind of stuck to Ipsic. Like that was kind of always my main thing. Um, I mean, I like everyone else too, I, I have shotguns, rifles, and I kind of play with those every now and then, but um, nothing, nothing with a competition mindset. Okay. Okay. And, uh, so for the nationals, they were held in Selkirk, uh, Manitoba or at the Selkirk range in Manitoba, correct? That's right. Okay. How was, uh, traveling to the match? Uh, traveling was, was fine. I mean, I, I flew in on, uh, I, f I flew in. So, I mean, I was kind of the easy way to go. Right. I uh, was lucky enough that I have some friends who were driving from uh, from Ottawa. Um, 
uh, where I live. So it's, uh, they, I was able to give them my guns and give them all of my equipment. So it made travel a whole lot easier, right? Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, yeah, I guess when you're getting on a plane, you don't have to worry about that stuff. It's uh, a little bit more in and out, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, there's some, uh, some friends from my club. I have to give a, give a shout out to Yao, Jake and uh, Bob, Bob for helping me, uh, you know, transport to and from the range for that. So nice. Probably a lot more reliable than uh, Air Canada. Oh yeah. And I mean, (laughs) Well, uh, you know what? One of the main reasons I was uh, I was I was I was actually really happy that they they were driving. I was able to give them my guns. It's just in light of sort of the political environment right now. Like if I if an airline loses my guns right now, I am beyond effed, right? Like I am just I have no recourse. So it's and I have lost firearms before through travel through airline travel in past years. Mind you, I always got them back like you know a day or two later, but. Um, it's still, it's still uneasy, right? When that happens. It's a stress you don't really need. (laughs) That's right. Especially going into something like nationals. Like the last thing you want to worry about is, oh no, my guns are lost. Like, am I going to get them in time? And, you know, so to speak. So. Yeah. And then you're there and yeah, you don't have your equipment with you. That's pretty big deal. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that being said, I mean, I, I would say the vast majority of people that, that flew with guns. Like I didn't hear of any horror stories of them losing anything, but uh, regardless, right. Okay. And what was that your first time at that range? It, uh, I'd been there before uh, 2018. I think Selkirk held the nationals there. So. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. I shot, so you're sta- fam- I shot standard you're, that year. So you're familiar with it then? I was. Yeah. So that, that, that was kind of nice, right? It's actually, I think it's actually kind of a nice range. Like they got a, a fair amount of space and a good amount of bays. So, was it a 40, 45 minutes from uh, downtown Winnipeg? I guess in the airport. Um, it was about, th- I believe, thirty-five minutes or so. Like I, w- I didn't stay in Winnipeg. I was in an Airbnb uh, a little bit further away, I think in Gimli. But for me, it was maybe forty-five minutes away. So not that okay. much more. Not bad. Airbnbs are the way to go when you're shooting and you're like hauling in a bunch of like guns and gear into a ho- in a, into an Airbnb. No one's going to bat an eye, but walking around a hotel lobby or something like that with that kind of stuff, a little bit harder to do. Yeah. yeah and I mean, not just that too, but I mean, uh, an Airbnb allows you to like, I had a full kitchen, right? So I could actually cook proper meals. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, you know, it's like you don't really want to just be eating restaurants and McDonald's or whatever, whatever have you, like the week of nationals, right? It doesn't the food, the food you eat on the road is never as good as the food you can make yourself. So that's oh, so important. You're, you're saying you have yeah. to eat like a champion. That's my problem. Uh, it certainly can help you a lot. <laughs> you got a group of guys, you'd be a lot cheaper too than a hotel. I would think so. Yeah. yeah. Like we, we were, we were three in the Airbnb. So I think that was uh much cheaper. Yeah. Nice. And uh, how was the actual like uh, match? Let's say the stages compared to other nationals or level threes that, that you've done. Um, yeah. So the stages, so yeah, like I said, I guess I, uh, I arrived there on, on, I flew in on Tuesday that was mainly for registration. And then uh, right away, I, I went to the range to see the stages. The, um, I mean, they'd given the match booklet, I think like a month or, so, or maybe more before. But of course, there's like a hand-drawn sketch. So I mean, even though you, you can't really tell like what is actually the, uh, the, the, the layout or really how far targets are going to be. But I got there on Tuesday and I noticed the, the stage style was more of a, like a run and gun style. Like, like a lot of targets were really close. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and so I'm kind of, kind of looking at this kind of going like, Oh no, like I'm, I feel like I'm at, I'm at a disadvantage looking at this. Um, I mean, just from what I identify as my own style, like I'm, I'm, I'm more accurate than I am fast on the trigger. So I tend to believe like my, uh, my ideal shooting style is something that's a little bit more of like a, a technical match style, uh, you know, good movement dynamics, you know, kind of some, some challenging shots, maybe more moving targets, uh, what have you. So mm-hmm. this was, I felt a little bit kind of at a disadvantage because certainly in open, right. There's a lot of guys that can press a trigger faster than I can. So I was kind of going, man, like 
this is going to be a hard one. But uh, but that being said, I mean, hey, that's nationals. That's just the light. That's just how it is. I was, however, very lucky. I wasn't shooting nationals until uh, Friday, Saturday. So I had some time. So checking out the stages Tuesday. And I was really lucky because through my, um, I'm sponsored with my local gun range, the RA Gun Club. Mm-hmm. And uh, I have to give a shout out to Bob Gowie, who's the IPSC rep at the club too. He came down and shot the match as well. But he really helped me. He, he, uh, he helped me secure uh, a range near Gimli. And uh, he, he actually brought down uh, 400 rounds uh, of ammo for me and some targets. So I was able to go to, on the Wednesday, I was able to go to that range and train for a day to, uh, to kind of, like after having seen the stages, right? So there was a bunch of targets that were certain target arrays and a lot of partials in that match, actually, too. Close partials, which are, can be very tricky, especially to shoot fast, I find. And so I kind of put, at the, I had a chance to kind of put targets really close, And so, you know, kind of hone my speed skills, if you will, right, to kind of just um, get my mind a little bit more in in line with uh, with what the match is, Uh, because, I mean, I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of guilty. Like when I when I train back at home, like a lot of the time I spend my time training things that are, you know, maybe more distance shots or, you know, more, you know, harder transitions or maybe more crazier shit. Right. But sometimes I don't spend maybe enough time on just the simple things of just how to, how to really machine gun a target, like from, from, you know, essentially right in front of you. Um, so that was good to, to be able to do. I think that did help me. Right. And then uh, Thursday took it, took it real easy, uh, kind of a calm before the storm type of thing. But, uh, and then Friday, Saturday, just put myself in the best mindset to be able to shoot the match then. Nice. Hmm. And, and weather, weather wise, how was it on the, on the Friday, Saturday, uh, Friday had a little bit of rain, like, uh, not, you know, kind of, um, something in be something in between a drizzle and like a very light rain. Okay. So just enough to kind of just enough to be annoying, I would think. Right. But nothing that was a, nothing that was a showstopper, but, uh, certainly kind of added to uh, a little more of the complexity, I guess. And, but, yeah. uh, Nothing too too bad, I guess. Saturday, I think was was pretty clear, so that was a good day. Nice, nice, yeah. Because it wrapped up on Saturday, and then you guys had a, I guess, a banquet the next day. No, or, or that evening. The banquet was that evening. Yeah. Okay. So we we finished shooting. We were Saturday afternoon, so we finished. I think it was around. We finished fairly early, actually. It was around four o'clock or so. Okay. And banquet, I think, was the doors opened at six and kind of went most of the evening. Nice. Was a good turnout for that too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, the uh, the venue was packed. I mean, there was uh, at, there wasn't even enough there wasn't enough uh, chairs for everyone. Like, there were some people that were standing. Oh. A lot of people. So right. I don't know if they. I don't know if there's more people that they more people that showed up than they expected, but still, big room. It, it ended up being like close to 450 competitors, right? Plus all the match officials. I would believe that, yeah, yeah, that was a definitely a, a big event, and um, yeah. So um, when I ask you this, you can't answer as a humble Canadian. You have to give me the honest truth. When you go into a match like this, are you going in expecting to win? Is that what you're telling yourself, or is it more I'm going to just do my best and and see what happens? um i'm you know i'll tell you honestly like i'm i'm the kind of person that i i really strive for the top so at a match like nationals especially uh i tell myself that especially this match like i'm i'm I, i show up to win like that's that's what i tell myself and um and honestly I, th- I think if you want to win a nationals or any major level three, like that's the mentality you have to have, mm. right? Because then if you are not telling yourself that, then you're maybe not pushing yourself hard enough. You're not like doing what's required to really make that a reality, right? You, you have to put yourself in that mindset. Like you show up to win, you want to be that guy. And so um, that's what I do for myself. I think at the matches that, that, that really, 
uh, that really resonate with me. You know, like when I try and go for provincials or nationals or any other major match that I'm, I'm really, that really becomes the focus point of my summer then, or my season anyways. Uh, that's what I, that's what I tell myself. That's what I try and have. Okay. I like that answer. Um, and what are you affected at all by what's going on around you? Let's say, uh, so you're somebody that, you know, there's a few shit, cause there's a lot of top open shooters there and you know who the competition is. Do you, do you get affected? Are you watching them at all? Or are you just in your own zone and you're not really worried about whether they crush the stage or not? Yeah. I mean, first off, I got to say open is a, th- uh, this year, especially open was a stacked division. I mean, I was certainly humbled to see like how many good shooters there are in open. Um, and I guess I, I approach this now the same way for a long time now. Like I would say, I, I don't look at any match results as they're happening. And I tend to try, if I can, I try to ignore, um, I try to ignore like what other shooters have been doing or what my direct competitors or how they've done or whatnot. Um, I go in, I shoot my own game. Mm. I, uh, I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't look at any, any results, right. Even cause there's, you know, Friday after day one, you know, they, they post partial results. I mean, I found out later after day one, like apparently I was, I was kind of leading by a small margin after day one. Right. But I didn't know that until the very end of the match. But I mean, had I known that some, sometimes like knowing the results and kind of looking at that, like, I don't think that's something that would really help me. Mm-hmm. Uh, if anything, it would just add more stress. Like, oh, okay, I'm leading. Well, that means I need to like still, you know, it just, I'll just be thinking about that. And it's much better in my opinion. And I guess I just find it works for me. Uh, I, I'm a, I find it much better just to, not pay attention to any of the results at all. I go to the, I go to the match and I, I shoot my own game. I think about, uh, that way, I guess I, 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 not knowing anything else that's going around me. I always assume that someone is ahead of me. I always assume that, you know, someone's shooting better than me. And so that means that every single stage I'm shooting it, uh, it, it, it focuses me to say, okay, well, I can't, I can't relax. I can't, you know, slack off and like every stage is an opportunity to do the best that I can on that stage. Right. To kind of maintain, uh, maintain ahead of that sort of imaginary person that might be ahead of me. Right. Okay. Which is, uh, which is kind of funny. I mean, a, a small story uh, at the very last stage I shot on day two, right. I'm, uh, right at, right at, as soon as I finish, right. A couple of my squad mates who had been actually watching, the the scores as they were kind of happening they kind of came up to me and they kind of congratulated like congratulations remy like i think we think you did really we think you probably took it and i'm kind of going like what <laughs> you know, like i have no idea right so i just i'm like oh now i want to see the results like what's going on like so it's just this like you know operating in a bubble and then all of a sudden like dumbfounded that someone tells you information like that well i mean if you if you looked at how everyone else was doing like if you look at the overall like you won two stages but you're so consistent and you were so like in the top so consistently that you take the match. Right. So I, if, if you looked at like how you did on every stage, you might think you're doing terrible. Right. Even if you are doing really well. Well, there was. Um, well, thanks for that, by the way. I appreciate it. But uh, I mean, my strategy going into nationals, having seen the stages and kind of knowing I kind of tailored it to my strengths and weaknesses, too. Right there were certainly some stages um, mostly short courses that were, you know, a lot of targets were just, you know, right in front of you essentially. Right. And it was those stages in particular, some of them anyways, was a game of just how fast can you draw and pull the trigger and do a mag reload. Right. Yeah. Um, Those are stages where I just know that, I mean, yeah, I can certainly try and, push a little harder and maybe win that stage, but at the, at a, at a potential high risk of making an error, right. If you get a miss on, on a stage like that, like a, even a 40 round course of fire, that's just like a blaster stage and you get a miss, that's going to hurt so hard. Right. So yeah. the risk reward on a stage like that is okay. Maybe I can push a little more. If I win the stage, maybe I'll gain another five points or more competitors. But if I make a mistake, I could lose like 20 points or more. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And then, so anyways, I, on those stages, I, I just kind of said, okay, I'm going to shoot, I'm going to shoot still respectively, you know, trying to aim for maybe 85, 90% um, score on that stage. But I knew that my strengths are more on the field courses, right? I can kind of, um, I feel like I'm, I have a, I'm good with movement and I, I try and optimize sort of, I find things in the field courses that help me kind of gain time on there to kind of be maybe a little bit more, gain a bit more points over my competitors in those areas. So that, that was kind of my game. And I, I guess I feel that kind of worked out. Right. So to your point, right. I mean, I didn't win a lot of stages, but I guess I didn't have to too much. Right. If you kind of say good consistency, yeah. right. Not too many blowouts. Did you have any stage blowouts? Uh, as in like major errors. Yeah. I had, I had one, I had one really crappy stage to be honest. Yeah. That, uh, uh, well, one that I'm really not happy about, but it was, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the stage, but there was one where you, it was called parasailing. You're, um, there's a big wall in front of you and you're kind of on this platform where like with the rope, know, on, the rope on each the side. Rope, yeah. There's like a two by two, there's like a two by two, um, a two by two foot, uh, area for shooting area. Anyways, a lot of the guys, I mean, you could either hang off the side and shoot strong hand and then hang off the other side, shoot weekend. Uh, or what a lot of the top guys did, they kind of hooked their foot to to shoot the other side uh, or to hook the foot on either side. You can do freestyle on both sides. That, of course, did end up being the faster way. But when I tried that and walked through, I, um, I, was, I tried kind of hooking my foot on the, to do the lean on the left side. And I really found I was like, mm, this is not stable enough or I was, you know, the, the risk of falling off was really high and it was like a procedure per shot fired if you fell off essentially. So Ouch, yeah. way too, way too risky. So, mm-hmm. but on the right side, I felt good. So when I shot it, I shot freestyle on the right side to hook my foot. Uh, but I shot weak hand on the left side. When I went to go shoot weak hand on the left side, I feel like that kind of like I was slower, right. To begin with. And then when I shot weak hand on one of the targets, I lost my dot and then kind of in the slight moment of panic, I couldn't find my dot, but I was thinking that, uh, you know, kind of worrying that, oh no, maybe my something wrong is with my dot. Like I, as in like the battery or something is not working. And then I just took a chance, I took a shot. <laughs> and then of course, no, the dot was just low and I whacked the penalty. Uh-huh. And so, and then I was like, oh no, I found my dot, like you idiot. And then just, <laughs> okay, fine, keep shooting. So just like one of those rookie mistakes where I was like, oh my God, like my only, like that no shoot was the only error really I did in the whole match. And like, it was a dumb mistake. <laughs> so that's, yeah, that's it. And and how, so after that, how quickly do you shake that off for the, to go to the next stage? Yeah, you know, it, and you're right. It is extremely important. You cannot, if you make a mistake like that, you have to just forget it. You have to move on. The next stage is, is like a new opportunity to do the best you can, right? Um, because that is very much a thing, right? So I've seen a lot of competitors and I hear of a lot of competitors. Uh, even at this match, I've heard of someone who made a mistake like that. And then the next like two stages, they f- continue to kind of shoot poorly as a result because their mind is still thinking about the previous yeah. error, right? They're kind of like ruminating over it. Huh. Well, um, yeah, no, I, I, I just quickly, as quickly as I possible, put it on my mind. Um, if anything, if anything, I almost, I kind of get mad at myself, right? I kind of go like, oh, as if I made that error. And then you kind of, you kind of decide to make it up to yourself, right? On the next like two, three stages after to kind of, keep the match going strong. Right. So nice. Nice. Um, you talked about, um, uh, some of the prep work you did and, but leading up to the nationals, did you, were you say dry firing, live firing a little bit more than you would for a regular all three or a level two or, um, yeah, you know, this, uh, this year and even the last year was, has been in terms of training has been interesting. So I I guess I have to preface by saying that I have a family with two small children, right? I have a two and a half year old son and a one and a half, one year old daughter. So the family dynamics makes it hard to find time to go to the range. So the net result is actually, um, I've been shooting the last year and this year, I've been shooting way less than I normally do. Uh, or at least, uh, you know, it's been kind of decreasing just because trying to find, you know, two, three hours to leave the family and, um, 
and go to the range is, is difficult, right? But you're right. I have been doing a lot of dry fire uh, throughout most of the summer. I mean, I probably started around in, in May, uh, you know, since the, since the main, the first big match, big L3 for me was around mid June. So starting around about a month ish before, uh, is when I really started to kind of get serious about my training. So that means dry fire every day, 20, 30 minutes. Uh, and then, and I, and I, I try and make dry fire fun, right? Like I, I'm not just someone who sits there and does repetitions of a draw a static at a dot on the wall, right? I'll, I'll actually go to my garage. I'll make a, I'll put up targets. I'll actually make a stage, right? I'll make something of interest. I will practice movement. I'll practice entrance and exits. I'll practice my reloads. I'll practice, you know, kind of try and do as much as I possibly can without actually shooting the gun. So, uh, and really in dry fire, you can probably do at least, I would say about 90% of what you need to practice, you can do in dry fire. And, and even, and if you're present and how you're pressing the trigger, and if you're really, you know, what your grip needs to feel like and how, how pressing the trigger needs to feel, you can still get really good practice in dry fire. And then those times when I was able to shoot at the range, um, I, 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 I would still have, I, you know, maybe I, on average, maybe shoot once a week, um, sometimes more, sometimes less. But uh, when I go to the range, I would often recreate what uh, I was doing in dry fire, right? And then just kind of trying to marry that last 10% of the training that I couldn't do, right? The shooting component, trying to marry it to whatever I was doing and using that feedback from how I was shooting the gun and how the shots went on the target to then bring that back to dry fire and say, okay, like the way that I was holding the gun, okay, was that proper? Was that proper or not? Like, do I need to change anything? And then you can, you can, you just need to be really conscious and really present in, in every, every time you shoot, every time, you know, like really, every time you have a good shot, you kind of record that feeling of recoil and, and feeling of how your sights move and everything. And, and, and you take that with you. And every time you're using that to improve, uh, both dry fire and live fire every time you do it. So that's kind of how it goes. Uh, and of course, nationals, speaking specifically in nationals, it, uh, I guess there's two modes of training that you would do. So again, starting maybe about, you know, three, four weeks ahead of time, ideally the first couple of weeks, maybe you're maybe first two to three weeks, you're, you're focusing on, um, I guess, what am I going to call it? Like pushing the envelope kind of training, right? You're training sometimes at, at failure points, right? You're going to like, you know, say if you're training a swinger or something, well, you're going to practice how many, you know, how many shots can I get on a swinger in one pass or something, right? You're going to train to failure. How fast can I shoot a partial at whatever distance, right? It's okay in those circumstances to get misses, to get penalties, to get deltas, to get whatever, because you're trying to learn and you do it in a bit of a two-step forward, one-step back approach, right? You kind of go balls out if you will right okay fail and then okay that's two steps forward take one step back all right now try and find what now try and find where is the balance point that i can still get my shots still get it representative and with that approach you're trying to make you're trying to push your skill you're trying to make your your old best your new normal if you will nice uh, and then in the last uh, especially the last week of nationals what you should be transitioning to then is consistency training. So, and that's what, that's what I did. So you, now you're setting up stages and setting up uh, different target arrays, different positions. You know, you just put cones in the cones in the ground or set up some walls, things to run, run to and from. Right. And you're making, you're making stages and you're making things. Okay. I'm going to run here, shoot these targets, run over there, shoot those targets. And you only give yourself one chance to do whatever you imagine. So, uh, and if you screw it, screw it up too bad, that's right. That you move on to the next thing. Okay. Make up a different thing and you keep on making it always new and always fresh. You don't do repetitions because in a match setting, you don't get to do repetitions with the mm -hmm. consistency training. Now you are, uh, forcing yourself to be, okay, how do I need to perform to be able to give, to deliver on demand my best performance? And usually when you do consistency, tra consistency training, you'll now be trying to zero in on your, I'll call it your 90% skill, right? So if, you know, so comparison to the two-step, one-step back approach, right? You might be training at 120% for failure, and then you kind of take a step back and you're trying to find out where 100% is and make that reliable. But now you're trying to shoot at 90% means that 
90% means that everything feels stable, right? You're, you're, you, you can 90% by definition should be, you could shoot something 10 times and get the same time and the same hits consistently. So that's what it's about. Nice. And uh, I wanted to ask you, so you went from production to standard to open. So from standard to open, uh, going from irons to, to a dot, how long did you, would you say that it took you to get comfortable that you actually felt like you could compete at a high level, I guess. Right. Uh, transitioning from standard to open took, took longer than I had anticipated. Uh, it was, and I think that's just because that's kind of the nature of what open is. It is such a radically different division than I think any of the other divisions, to be honest. So, I mean, going from production to standard, I, did, I don't think it took me as long. I mean, probably uh, I would normally maintain that, you know, shoot about a, shoot about 5,000 rounds and usually the gun starts to feel like part of your hand or, or along with decent dry fire. But from standard to open, it was, it was longer than that. It took me at least a year, if not a little bit more. And so, I mean, if you think about it, there's so much different about, about open. So um, open is you've got like, you've got a compensator and, and a red dot, right? So it, it, those are big changes. Um, mm -hmm. Another aspect, another aspect too, I guess I'll kind of back up a bit, like talking about the, sort of the three main divisions. I mean, production, it, it's all about what these, the main divisions I think want you to focus on and what they teach you. So production is all, is all about, you know, accuracy, teaching you, um, how to get your alphas, right? Like making sure that you're good with your front sight, trigger pull, all that standard. When you go to standard, I think it teaches you how to have good fundamentals, right? Essentially how to, how to hold the gun properly, because if you're not with, with major recoil and whatnot, if you are not holding that gun properly, it will eat you alive. Mm. Um, it'll just, you know, Delta mic everywhere and you'll just, it'll just go everywhere. Your, your, your targets will start looking like shotgun patterns. <laughs> um, but then going to open, it is, it is, I think open teaches you how to be aggressive, right? Because now open is like, you're driving formula one, baby. It is, <laughs> it is like everything that could possibly make that gun operate faster. It's been done to it. Um, and so, yeah, the compensators there, I mean, it, the gun essentially doesn't have any flip for the most part. So your, your, your splits and everything can be insane, right? You even have a gas pedal and stuff like that. So the gun is, 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 uh, much better supported. And then the dot, the dot itself is, is a gigantic change, right? From iron sights. So the real, the real strength of the dot is you have a very fast target acquisition and target transition, um, with it, right? That's really what makes a dot fast. Uh, cause I mean, cause if you think about it, the dot is the amalgamation of your iron sights, right? Normally with uh, production or standard or any iron sight gun, like you're, you're going to, you know, when you look on a target, okay, we're well, going to line up your sight picture. You're going to make sure your, uh, front sights in the right place and then you'll pull the trigger. There's a certain time there. And also too, if you think about it, like you would never pull the trigger with iron sights, say if your front sight was in a weird place, like, you know, way off to the left and mm -hmm. almost obscured by like the rear left blade of your rear sight or something. Right. But if the dot being the amalgamation of that sight picture still tells you that the dot's going to be in the right place in the right target, you just pull the trigger. And so your, your brain almost has to kind of get used to that. Like you just kind of, things happen so much quickly. They, you, you end up processing things so much faster. Um, and you can kind of, it really, that's what really allows you to be more aggressive with the gun. And, and those are kind of some of the dynamics that take longer to understand. It took me longer to understand anyways, before I was really able to unlock, I would say the full potential of open, um, you know, on top of just also having, you know, reloading mags, the mag wells bigger and, you know, other little dynamics on the gun too, right? Everything's faster. Um, and it's just, uh, everything, everything around, everything around, like just doing everything faster. So for instance, for instance, to like, say if you're shooting, um, like a swinging target, right? Like some, you're hitting some pieces, some activator steel, there's, uh, whatever static targets in between you, you usually with any other division, you'll go, uh, activator static target, and then the swinger. 
Well, with open now you can get away with more right now it becomes activator and sometimes two static targets in the swinger, <laughs> right? That becomes now the norm yeah. because now the dot lets you do that. The compensator and, and the flip of the gun are much less. So it lets you do that as well, right? You can transition so much harder. You can do things so much more. And not only that, it comes to a point where if you are not doing that, you might actually get left behind because your competitors are going to do that. Mm -hmm. Right now, now there's a certain like norm baseline of aggression, if you will, that like is now expected in open that it, that's not inherent in the other division. So doing that kind of thing, kind of learning to shoot at a faster pace to learning to really uh, take advantage as best I can about the, the, the transition speeds and the acquisition speeds and and really seeing how far you can go. Um, with it took, took, a, took some out of time, right? Because I, I think that's just, um, those are elements that you don't really see in other divisions, I find. You mentioned uh, uh, when you were making the transition from irons to, uh, to red dot, just curious, on your irons, were you using uh, front sight focus or target focus? Because that would have been a switch to your red dot as well, right? If you were using front sight focus, at least. Correct. I mean, uh, I, I was always a front sight focus kind of guy. It, uh, well, tell you what, this is sort of a half answer to that. So the, 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 the short answer is yes, front sight all the time, right? Even on a close target. But in some circumstances, in some circumstances, I would allow myself um, to have sort of a focus point in between the irons and the target, depending on the situation. But um because usually it's just about seeing, it's just about seeing what your, like your eye and your eyes, I find your eyes normally adjust to that, right? It becomes sort of an automatic brain thing. You will, you, you, you always start out by trying to find your front sight, but sometimes you'll allow yourself to pull the trigger because uh, I guess to back up a second, right? Like the normal way you, you transition or sight picture, you would look at the target right drive your gun to or drive your front sight to where it is and then in mm -hmm. that process you're also bringing your focus point back to the front sight in an ideal circumstance you would wait for your uh complete focus to be on the front sight but depending on the target distance depending on what you're doing in that process of i guess bringing your eyes from the target focus to the front sight focus there can be a point in there where your brain says okay the sight picture is good enough you might be, you know, 75% the way there to being focused on your front sight, but your brain is saying that's already good enough. Like I don't need to wait that last 25%. So mm -hmm. you pull the trigger, mm -hmm. right? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying you should necessarily like train that, but that's something that I think your brain automatically does with practice, right? Like after a while, you just kind of start to see uh, how much more you can get away with. Right. Okay. Um, I think that's all my question. Actually, I wanted to ask you. So, have you have you competed at a at a world event? I I have. Yeah, I competed at one worlds, twenty seventeen. I think it was in France. France. Okay. Okay. And are you planning to go to uh, South Africa? I guess in a few years. Maybe. Maybe Fa family, family depending, right? <laughs> yeah. To, to be determined. I mean, I, let, let me put it this way. I am, uh, cause I believe, I believe next, next year's nationals will be the last nationals that will count for that ranking. Am I right? I think it sounds right. Yeah. It sounds about right. So I think I do plan on shooting nationals next year. So right now what I'm telling myself is that I'm leaving myself the option open to be able to go to South Africa. Okay. Hmm. Right. But yes, you know, kind of with a small family and uh, whatnot, um, yeah, especially after having spent this entire season, uh, you know, my wife is really the true the, the, the true champion in all this, right? <laughs> Helping me balance the kids. Right. So I, I, <laughs> if I start talking to her about World Shoe right now, she'll just like she'll just yell at me. <laughs> yeah, and so. and uh, um, South Africa is a bit of more, more of a commitment than going to Manitoba. So, <laughs> Yes, that's right. Well, I, I mean, I think she might just come with me at that point. That's probably oh, going to be the, uh, yeah. she's going to be like, you're in South yeah. Africa. You're, I'm t you're taking me with you. I'm like, okay. Yeah. It's a vacation. It's a family vacation. That's <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's how yeah. I got to sell it. There's some shooting in there. Um, did you guys have any questions for Remy? 
No, I mostly just mm-hmm. wanted to get the target focus versus front sight focus because that's okay. something I was, I'm always arguing with Kelly about. So <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh, that was great. Thank, thanks so much for the insight and uh, the Nationals recap. And it's awesome you came on with us tonight. Yeah, it was great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks, Remy. Thanks, Remy. Cheers, guys. Take care. Okay, we'll get into uh, listener feedback. Uh, we have one email, uh, which I will uh, read. Am I coming through? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you just fine, Mo. Okay, sorry. I was, I was thrown <laughs> off. Um, so the I, email. I was trying to. Okay. Uh, I, I'm a longtime listener, and I find myself skipping through what we did in Guns and Guests when it deals with solely American content. Having Kyle talk about his experiences in the U.S. and the new pistols and ARs he is buying is irrelevant to the majority of Canadian shooters. I think it's great he made the move and is shooting great matches. However, having him talk about and having American guests on talking about U.S. three-gun competitions is not something relevant to Canadian shooters anymore. Hey, I might be wrong, and it's your show. Just thought I'd pass along my thoughts. I just, I'm just i looking forward to more Canadian content and guests. Thanks. John D. Not going to be happy about today's show. Um, but uh, my thoughts on this is uh, the three-gun guy we had on, that match came from the original three-gun match. So like there, there's some like history to uh, to that match that was uh, that was kind of interesting, and in terms of like we we had the uh, we had a running gun guy on right, and uh, that style of match is starting to gain in popularity, and I'd, I'd mm-hmm. imagine we're going to start seeing that up in yeah. Canada. So like yeah. there's going to be some stuff where it's like America's going to have it five or ten years before we are, and I want to see what's new and cool and coming down the pipe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I'll, I'll comment on it too. Like, uh, so yeah, the tactical games. You somebody wants to. Bring them to Canada. You, you, you can. Like, it's not like it's mm-hmm. not relevant to Canada. You, you can do that in Canada. As far as like Rocky Mountain Three Gun, like I'm, I'm guessing that's the uh, match he's talking about with the Three Gun because he made it sound like we. That's all we talk about. But uh, that one, there's still Canadians who travel down here for matches mm-hmm. all the time, and there are people who travel from Canada with. Canadian guns to shoot said matches. So bringing some matches to the view that if somebody wants to travel and is looking, hey, I want to travel. It's a long time to long ways to travel. What match am I going to go to? Bring some insight on some of these matches. I I do agree. It's it's not in a U.S. podcast, but Mm -hmm. just I mean a major match down here and. People want to know what they're getting into. I think it's only fair to put that out every now and then. Yeah. I live vicariously through you too. When you're talking about like your, your tourist uh, yeah. subcontent, like that has no bearing on what we can oh, do in I, Canada, but I, I still want to know. About I can it. understand the frustration. Absolutely. Hearing me talk about that stuff. Absolutely. I wish I could figure out a way to not make it sound like I'm, I'm trying to rub it in people's faces. Cause I'm not, I I'm not trying to rub it in people's yeah, faces no, or it. make people jealous at all. Uh, the segment's called what I did with guns and that's what I'm doing in guns. So, yeah. I mean, I'm not, you're muted. Yeah. Drill said, you're still making me jealous though. Yeah. 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 <laughs> whether, you're, okay. whether you're trying yeah. to or not, but I mean, I, I mean, we try, we, we do do our best to get a lot of like Canadian stores, manufacturers, uh, shooters, like tonight's main topic guest, definitely a Canadian. And, uh, but then, I mean, we're all into firearms and when it comes to uh, consuming information about firearms, there's so much content, way more content out of the U.S. Like, if, like in terms of YouTube channels, and yeah. it's just—it's almost like if you were just going to stick to the Canadian stuff, there's just not enough. But I mean, we're we're trying to put out more. But mm-hmm. well, and I I view it like first off, I I should say like thank you very much for the email because, and I'm trying to be respectful in the response, but respectfully, I do disagree with what he's saying in the email but like you there's such a vast like you were saying old vast difference in sports 
the shooting sports down here and bigger, way bigger. I mean, you were talking 450 people at Ipsic Nationals. You get more than that in a single division nationals down here. Yeah. Well, right? Like okay. they have to split them up that they're completely different matches for production or mm-hmm. or whatever. And so I think there's something that Canadians could learn and myself and in, was included in that when I was doing matches, trying to learn from the people who put in on these big matches. And I think there's something to be learned. And like I said, with the travel and finding some place to go and it's encouragement that you can go and it's worth it. No, yeah. you just continually encouraging Canadians to go down South. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <Every week>. <laughs> <laughs> Our current government is encouraging us to go. <laughs> but anyway, so we'll move on. From no, the that. Wait, wait, wait. Pushing. What? The government's pushing. I'm <laughs> saying I'm, I'm welcoming. <laughs> what, what's the temperature there? Is it triple digits? Has it been triple digits for months? Yes, it is. Not, it is right, <laughs> right now, it's it's ninety seven degrees. Right now, right before we started the show, it was a hundred. So yeah, I'll pass on that. But yeah. it's yeah. been nine. It'll be ninety till we were looking probably middle of September. We're gonna start Celsius. slowly. Really hot. This is <laughs> yeah. show. I don't uh, do Fahrenheit. <laughs> I, I'm definitely not doing a maple seed there. That's for sure. So. <laughs> yeah, in the winter. Yeah. All right, but we appreciate the letter for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And thank you for listening. Um, Kyle, do you want do we have anything for YouTube? Uh yes, we do. Uh it was from last week's episode, the Rocky Mountain Three Gun. Uh from R. Boynes, which I believe this was Rich, and he was uh cabin mate, another RO there, and he said, Kyle, it was great meeting you at RM three G. See you there next year. And absolutely rich meeting with you and talking with you and we'll definitely see you next year cool yeah. and yeah that was it for for youtube all right um if you go to our lovely website slamfireradio.com uh, you'll find a cabela's link if you use the link to make a purchase it that helps to support the show and then once a month uh we will talk about the uh stuff that's been bought and uh, also, you can support the show through uh, Patreon and Player. We would appreciate that. If you'd like to email the show, and we'll read your, your letter on live, uh, you can do so at slamfireradio at gmail.com. I think we covered all the other messages that... Uh, uh, what is, yeah, I didn't uh, see anything through Facebook or Instagram. Well, Russ, Russ, says, Russ says, I don't worry about American stuff because it's all about the shooting sports. Yeah. 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 And uh, 604 Corey on player saying he's just butt hurt because you're in Freedomville and he's missing out. <laughs> I'm butt hurt. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> it's mutual. Um, I think that's it. Uh, shout outs tonight, guys. Uh, I'd like to shout out my Beatles IITs from the last Maple, Maple Seed. I know who they are. Okay. Uh, I know I don't have anything for this week. Okay. Uh, my shout out is to Remy, who was our main uh, main topic guest. I thought he gave some really great insight in uh, in what it takes, I guess, to get to his level, right? The the yeah. the, the thought process and uh, you know how he game plans and, and mm-hmm. how he, you know, I, I wish, break- I wish, sorry, go ahead. I thought his breakdown of the divisions, like when he was talking production, you learn your, your trigger control yes. and your accuracy and then standard and then go into open. I, I hadn't heard the divisions broken down in quite mm-hmm. that way before. Which oh, it was pretty, cool. pretty deep stuff. huh? Yeah. He's got like meta analysis over top of everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Production's all about accuracy and then opens all about like how aggressive, like that, yeah. that I have heard before is like, you have to be really aggressive because the gun lets you do so much. So you have to be. Like, oh yeah. Try yeah you have, you're going to be in. on the bitter edge. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so join us on our discord server. Uh, watch us on Facebook, YouTube and player. 
join this CCFR, which is really, really important for the cause. And see you next week. Good night, everybody. Good night. So if you have any comments or questions for the show, please send an email to slamfireradio at gmail.com. Now go grab a gun and shoot something. When the talking is over, it's time to get a gun.